And that was the first time that God worked in my heart through my own reading of the scripture. And I remember I stopped and I was like, whoa, what just happened? Like, I think that's the Holy Spirit. I'm not sure. But I know something just happened. And so I read that story again and again and again. When you think about the profound influence of the Bible on the world, the way that it has shaped our culture, whether you're a follower of Christ or not, it's probably a good idea that you know at least what it says. It's going to be about us taking and reading the Bible. All righty. Welcome to the Take and Read podcast. My name is Chad, Pastor Chad. Uh, As I've said before, I'm a pastor, I'm a husband, I'm a father, I'm a brother, I'm a son, but most importantly, I'm a follower of Jesus Christ. And uh, if you're just joining us, the Take and Read podcast is very, very simply me with a friend of mine, uh, a different friend every time, but we take a passage of scripture, we're working our way through the Gospel of Mark right now, and we take a passage and we, we talk about it, we chew on it. Today, I'm really, really excited because I have LJ. Hey, yo. What's up, man? Pastor LJ. Uh, he and I get to serve on the same team. Uh, we've gotten to serve for several years now together. And he, I am so excited that you're here for this particular passage that we're going to look at because what LJ is good at and is called to as a pastor is he gets to lead the area of our kids' ministry. And so he he has to wrestle through very complex biblical ideas, but make them palatable for the youngest generation in our church family. So, so excited that you're here today. Um, it's good to be here. Welcome. I want you to know I haven't read this yet. No, no. And, and the true to form, <laughs> I told him, come in, bring a Bible. Do not prep. Do not plan. He doesn't even know what passage we're going to be in. So this is such a cool cool time. Uh, But before we start, what I like to do is if you're a first time guest, have you kind of give us some background or your experience with the Bible. So start with, do you remember kind of when you first encountered the Bible and kind of what your thoughts were about it? Yeah. So I I did not grow up in the church. I had um, a grandfather and grandmother that raised me my granddad was in the church a lot, but I was not. Um, but I remember my first interactions with the scriptures were being invited to things like VBS and then having someone teach me just some simple truths of the scripture. VBS, what's VBS? Vacation Bible School. Okay, so is that, you You hang out for a time in the summer. Oh yeah, so you go to a church maybe eight to 12 in the morning, you know, and um you have lots of volunteers, people doing kids' activities, and then in that process, they're trying to teach you about Jesus a little bit. Okay, okay, yeah, and man. it's fun, right? I mean, oh, it was, a, it was a blast. Yeah, okay. So did that, and then into middle school and high school through some people that had mentored me um, and continued to encourage me to come to church, I started coming to a church and started wrestling with the scriptures myself. Okay, yeah. and so that was about... High school? 12, 13 okay. initially, and then lots of ups and downs in between. Yeah. Yeah, man. Yeah, okay. So you've had, you can remember pretty far back in as you encounter the word at different stages in maturity, and but now you, like me, believe this to be the very communication from the creator of the universe. He has revealed himself in his word, and so we have a, a particular privilege when we get to come and read it. Absolutely. And and so when you uh, encounter the word, another thing I, I want to know, and, and I'm sure other people want to know, is what does your time with the Bible look like? How often are you in, in the Bible? Uh, how do you determine what you're going to read? Is there a particular kind of location in your house or in the office or in a park or wherever you go and however you do it, a time of day? What else is involved in that time? So just, yeah. Walk yeah, so I'll give you just a bunch of information, and if you have follow-up questions, just yeah, ask yeah, me the yeah. follow-up questions. Um, so I'll start with the daily thing. So what I what I try to do is pick, you know, for a time, uh, a book in the Old Testament, so whether that's Exodus, Genesis, Jeremiah, whatever, and just work my way through it. And then 
sometimes that can take months. Hmm. It could take a while. And once I'm done with a book from the Old Testament, I'll jump to the New Testament. And are you taking a chapter at a time or just a section that maybe yeah. makes sense? Can or? I give you a, kind of a church word? Yeah. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. Maybe it's more of a seminary word. Okay. Uh, so pericopes are really important. Right. And so typically earlier in the week what I'm doing is just reading where I feel like a, a new thought or a new story started. And I'll read until I feel like that thought or story has ended. Okay. And then the following day, I'll reread that and just pray as I'm reading that the Lord would show me something. And once I feel like he's working on me, I'll, I'll go to the next pericope, if you will. Okay. So sometimes, especially in the Old Testament, man, some of those can be five, six chapters long. But, and then you get in the New Testament, and sometimes it's like five verses long. Right, right. So it just depends. You describe something that I think is, is pretty telling. You are, you're not just sitting down and reading a book, but you are engaging with God through this time. So mm-hmm. there is this activity of reading and prayer, and it's dynamic. It's, Absolutely. You say that the Lord is working on you. When, uh, give me an example of what does that even mean? I'll tell you the very first time. Okay. Happened, like, it was mind-blowing to me. I was in eighth grade, and I'd heard all this, like, you need to read your Bible. I'm like, have you ever read the Bible? It's hard to understand. Like, well, just keep reading. It'll click eventually. I don't know about that. Um, <laughs> but I remember I was sitting in my room. Somebody had gifted me a Bible, and I was reading through Acts. And in the early in Acts, like Acts 1 through 4, um, you see where Peter and John are coming to the temple, and they enter by the gate that's called beautiful is what it says. And they, they meet this guy who can't walk. And so it goes through this interaction with him. And at the end of that interaction, he's running around like crazy because he had just been healed. And he goes in, in front of these other people and is telling them that Peter and John just healed him by the power of Jesus. And it's this big deal. Other people come to know Jesus in it. And that was the first time that God worked in my heart through my own reading of the scripture. And I remember I stopped and I was like, whoa, what just happened? Like, I think that's the Holy Spirit. I'm not sure, but I know something just happened. And so I read that story again and again and again. It's like my favorite story in the Bible now because of that. What happened in your heart? Yeah, God convinced me and showed me some sin in my life. Um, He showed me that He wanted to use me and the lives of the people around me through what I read in that story. Oh, that's awesome. So since then, I'm like, I know that the scripture can be hard to understand, but I also know that when I read it, there are times where I have those significant moments. That's not always the case, but right. when, when it's there, man, it's rich and it's good. Oh, that's perfect. Okay. So we've only gotten through the Old Testament section of your time with the Word. So you'll, you'll be uh, processing through a pericope yeah. of the Old Testament, and then you do you include other parts of the Bible as well? So, like I just finished going through Jeremiah again. So now that I'm done with that, I'm jumping back into the New Testament. Um, And so, like right now we're going through Romans, um, Kevin's preaching through Romans, and so I've been reading a little bit there, but in my own study, I'm getting back into Ephesians, uh, which is gonna take, it's only six chapters, but it's written differently. It's written more like a letter, not a story, and so it's going to take a little bit longer to get through. Uh, do you, like, roughly how much time would you say you spend in an ideal scenario in the Word? Like, what's your, what time of day, is there a spot in your house or otherwise, and is there coffee present? Like, what, what else is happening in that moment, in that time? Yes. Yeah, so I am not a morning person. Okay. My morning routine is wake up, get ready, poke my head out the door, make sure that the kids are ready for school, and then we bounce. <laughs> I mean, that's it, man. That's how I roll. Yeah. And so on the daily, it's more like if I'm here at the office and I have time, usually around 3, 3.30, I will take 15 to 30 minutes to do some study, to do some scripture reading prayerfully, or... I'll wait until I get home that evening after the kids go down and get my reading in at that time. So Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, so we're going to jump into 
some some word right now. Let's hit it a up. A pericope, if you will. And in Mark, uh, and as LJ kind of mentioned, the New Testament moves at kind of faster clips depending on what, what kind of book you are in. So again, yep. we're in the New Testament. We are in uh, one of the Gospels, and the Gospel of Mark, as we kind of discussed or, or talked about in the previous episode, gospel meaning good news, this is the account, and it's what we believe to be the earliest account that we have of the life and ministry of Jesus, uh, written by an early scribe, John Mark, a companion of Paul's and Peter's, and he has collected the teaching of Peter and in a very particular way. He's trying to inform us as well as, and primarily for him, the early believers, right? This early gathering of Christians. He's trying to um, inform them of a particular thing about Jesus Christ. And so as we read, we want to think, okay, Mark is trying to portray Jesus in a very particular way. And so what is it that we're, we're to draw about that? In the previous episode, we did talk about a few things. There were some words that came up like gospel, uh, we, uh, the idea of a prophet and Isaiah and the Old Testament, mm-hmm. and then this person coming on the scene known as John the baptizer and kind of his fulfilling what Isaiah had talked about, about this Messiah, that there would be one that would come in advance of this Messiah or Christ or anointed one that would be the deliverer of God's people and the savior of God's people. And so there would be, it would be marked by somebody coming in advance proclaiming that reality and so that's the role that john the baptist played we also got into a little bit about he's referencing baptism and that his baptism is going to be different than the baptism of the one or the anointed one the messiah who's going to come and so we understood that his baptism was of water but that the messiah would have a baptism of the holy spirit and that that means something different and a different power so then we're we're gonna jump into three verses that's it just three just three oh buddy we're gonna look and if we if we have time for more certainly we'll we'll jump into more but what i would love is we're gonna look at verses 9 10 and 11 which are the very next ones that that are kind of on the on the path here and it's a it's a particular small section that is packed with a lot. So we're in Mark chapter 1, verses 9 through 11. I'll go ahead and read it. I'm reading out of this, the Christian Standard Bible uh, the, today. Last time I was in the ESV, the English Standard uh, Version. And so I'm going to continue to rotate through different translations because I, th- I think there's benefit in, in experiencing oh, the different translations. So here we are, Mark chapter 1, verses 9 through 11. In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee and was baptized in the Jordan by John. Again, that's John the baptizer. As soon as he came up out of the water, he saw the heavens being torn open and the spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, you are my beloved son, with you I am well pleased. All right. It seems like a very short amount of words. But the first thing I want to do is what exactly, what's going on, what is being said? What are the words that when you read this or you are with other people reading it, LJ, what are the words that kind of need some splaining? i got some splaining to do here. Yeah. Um, all right. So first, you've already covered some of what it means to be baptized. That would obviously stand out to me. I want to make sure that we point that out. Um, and and then the action that happens, right? Like it's very clear that something incredible just happened. Jesus came out of the water. He looked up and saw that the heavens were torn open. What in the world does that mean? (laughs) Exactly. Like, man, I grew up in West Texas and seen some West Texas thunderstorms. I can't imagine what it means for the sky to be torn Torn open. open. Yeah. That's that's such an interesting descriptor. Yeah. And then the picture of the spirit descending like a dove not as a dove which sometimes in like christian artwork it's like there's a (laughs) dove coming down it's true but descending you know from high to low yeah okay and then the voice from heaven 
Why is that important that Jesus would hear, you are my beloved son mm. who, with whom I'm well pleased? Okay. You also see, I think in verse 9 there, Nazareth in Galilee, which that'll, that plays a role, right? We're going to see in the, in the story and the accounts of Jesus' ministry that multiple times, now for you and I, it's like, yeah, that's where he's from. What, you know, yeah. What's the big deal? But for them, there was this kind of common understanding that Nazareth was such a a minimal or kind of podunk kind of place yeah. that it was often said, what good could come out of that place? Like it was just like a nowhere spot. Yeah. Nobody special um, in Nazareth. Yeah. Which again, if you've traveled through West Texas, there's a lot of little towns that are like. I mean, maybe my hometown. Like but. I didn't even know this was here. What's <laughs> happening? Right. So. uh yeah, let's let's unpack this. So we've got some things to understand what they say. Baptism, how do you explain that to a, a kiddo? And again, this is a this is Jesus being baptized by John. So is he experiencing John's baptism that John had just described? Or is he experiencing the baptism that we would experience? I mean, you talk about a deep theological question there. Well, first, let me for the sake of working with kids. Um, I explain the action of baptism is simply throwing somebody under the water, the action, Mm -hmm. but it represents for us being buried in death with Jesus, right? We sinned against God. There was death, but through the grace and mercy of Jesus, we can have life. So when we come up out of that water, it's as if we're coming up out of our grave, if you will. Mm. And I I think kids connect with that. Uh, It's a miracle that has to take place. Um, and so when I talk to baptism about them, that's the way that I approach it. Now in this scripture, John's baptism was not that same type of baptism. John's baptism was more of, here's a stamp here. Here's that foot in the ground. That's a turning point for you in your life. You're turning from who you were, the things you used to do, and you're making a decision to follow Jesus or to follow God. Mm -hmm. So this is a. A significant scene. We see Jesus. Also, is there a sense in which he is endorsing or affirming the legitimacy of John the Baptist by being oh, baptized by him? No doubt. Okay. Uh, you think about for the people that were already following John, what it would mean for them to see him baptize this person who may or may not be the Messiah. You think about the people that may have been following Jesus to see him get baptized by this guy, John. They would recognize there's something unique in John. And there would be, I mean, based on what John said in the previous passage of Scripture where he says there's one who's coming who, a sandal I'm not even worthy to untie, right? Mm -hmm. There is this this worthiness of the one who is going to come, and then... Jesus being willing to submit to or be baptized by John the Baptist. There's something yeah, going yeah, on yeah, there. Go back to verse seven and eight. Yeah. Yep. Um, okay. So we've got this, this baptism scene. And as soon as he comes up out of the water, he saw the heavens being torn open and the spirit descending on him like a dove, the spirit. We're talking about the spirit of God. Yeah, it's capitalized in my Bible. Yeah, mine too. Yeah. So we're talking about the Holy Spirit or the spirit of the God of the universe. Yeah. And he comes down and the idea is that he comes down and then is now present with Jesus. Mm -hmm. And we're going to see the spirit's role in the next section of verses. But for now, we understand he's now arrived. The spirit of God has now arrived and resides with Jesus and we also see in 11, there's a clarification of who Jesus is. Yeah. I mean, it's a full picture of what we would call the Trinity. Okay. That's what I wanted to get to. Yeah, man. Here we are. We're at a, 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 an idea that we will not perfectly exhaust or explain in this moment. However. Impossible. Yes. However, there are ways in which God has revealed himself in this component of his identity to us and so we'll take what we can in terms of what he's revealed oh absolutely okay so uh you have in this scene jesus in the water comes out of the water the spirit of god descends 
the Father speaks from the heavens, right? This this kind of uh, resounding voice comes out and identifies Jesus as the Son. Mm-hmm. So we have what we would say in the earliest New Testament tradition, the affirmation of a triune God, one God, three persons. How do you begin the conversation with kiddos about that topic? Yeah, so it's circular teaching. We, we bring it up. We cover other things and we come back around to it and we just keep doing that. We actually did this this past Wednesday and two Wednesdays ago. Okay. So I asked the kids, no joke. I had no idea we we're going to read this today. I asked the kids, so um, do we be do we believe in a God that's three? And they were like, what do you mean? I was like, oh, okay, so let me ask this way. Um, is God one or is God three? And so some church kids were like, he's three. And then other kids were like, no, there's he's one. <laughs> I'm like, okay, so which one is it? And oh, it was hilarious. And it's like, okay, so everybody say with me, one and three and three and one. Like he's both and yes, that's the right answer. He is. Yeah. Hard to understand. Yes. And how do you think this would have been received by the original audience if there were Jews present in this audience that have that are receiving this gospel of Mark? I mean What's core to their faith is is a, is a small little passage that comes out of Deuteronomy. Mm-hmm. The Lord our God, the Lord is one, mm-hmm. right? So, and there's no other God besides him. And so now there's this introduction of Jesus is, is equal to God if in him saying that you are my beloved son, in you I am well pleased, and his spirit then resides with him, that he's not just another dude. That's right but that he is equal with the Father. He's not secondary. Right, and so how is that a an issue or how would that be a struggle for that original audience? I, mean, I think you take someone who has believed a certain way and then you rock their world, um, you're either gonna get angry and not move forward in that belief or have that belief just shake everything up. Mm-hmm. And I think you see both of those things play out. But, but there's some things that you can't deny in what you witness in scripture. Like you can't deny that the skies were ripped open. That wouldn't be something that someone missed. Mm-hmm. You were looking down for a moment and didn't happen to see it. No way, man. <laughs> so, Not if the sky's torn open. <laughs> so I, I would think that your heart would be ready, or at least your ears would be ready to hear something different. Mm-hmm. Um, I, th- I think once you get to that point, it's the point of surrender to allow yourself to understand something more or different or that point of protection of I'm comfortable with what I know and where I'm at and I'm not moving forward. Mm-hmm. And I think, you know, asking the question, okay, so what is a possible takeaway? What, wh- how does this affect how we might live our lives knowing that this happened, that what this explains about who Jesus is and in particular how does this possibly challenge some preconceived notions that we might have about who Jesus is yeah because it maybe we grow up in church and we go yeah I have no problem singing the songs about Jesus and but there there's this inevitable um, problem that we have is we start to then shape Jesus into a way that we find comfortable Mm -hmm. or convenient. Mm -hmm. And so what are some ways that this challenges you in thinking, okay, what are ways that I am kind of compartmentalizing Jesus or shaping him into a way that's approachable, but I need to be challenged yet again about what I truly understand and believe about who Jesus is. Yeah. So if I'm reading this and I'm thinking about, I mean, who is Jesus? Who's the Holy Spirit? Who's who's God? I'm reminded that like God was very intentional in the way that he allowed Jesus to come on the scene. There's a reason why he was baptized and the Spirit descended upon him. There's a reason why he spoke out loud to say, you are my, my beloved son. And, and I may not know exactly what that is. Mm-hmm. I may have an idea because I... I've had some experience in the church. I've had some experience reading the Bible, but I need to be careful about my own thoughts and beliefs towards God because it's limited. It mm-hmm. will always be limited. There's always room for me to learn something more. Right. And so this reminds me I need to be open to to learn something more, something different. Yeah. 
Is that fair? Yeah, it's fair. I yeah, I think when I think through my my life since I encountered Jesus the first time in in high school, I came into that encounter with a preconceived notion that I thought God was um, kind of this unattainable, distant, maybe slightly grumpy individual that was generally disappointed with me. And so it was kind of like, just try to stay off his radar, uh, you know, try not to upset him. And then when I encountered Jesus, I was thrust into this understanding that Jesus is compassionate, is loving, is good, and is for me. And so that was this radical transformation in the way that I had to conceive of who God was because Mm -hmm. I had seen God through Jesus. Mm -hmm. But even after that, I would kind of go through my life and and fall back into this, if I don't do, if I don't spend daily time in the Word, if I don't pray, or if I don't go to church, like if I don't do these things, I slip back into this view that God's generally displeased with me. God's frustrated, he's grumpy. And so this reminds me again of remember who who God has shown you about about yeah. himself through his son. Yeah. Have you have you had those moments reading through the Bible, especially the Old Testament where like something amazing happens and you think to yourself, "Man, if I could have just been there and witnessed that, <laughs> there's no way I would have stopped following God." Like yeah. if I could have been there when he split the Red Seas, like enough said enough said i'm right. i'm yeah. sold 100 <laughs> percent. but the the truth is like so i talked earlier about that first moment when i was in eighth grade and felt the holy spirit moving as i was reading the word you know i, I would think from that moment on i'd be convinced that i should follow god no matter what mm-hmm. but i found myself walking away from him running away from him at times right and it's because I took my, my eyes off of who he was. He's much bigger than I could ever imagine. And for whatever reason, went my own way, right? Well, when I come back to the scriptures and I'm reminded of who he is, I, like it, it takes me back again. And yeah. I'm in wonder at who he is. But if I don't have the practice of getting in his word, I lose that. Yeah. Yeah. That's such a good word. So we need to stay in his word. We need to take, we need to read it. We need to encounter the living God through his word on a regular basis so that we can keep our eyes on Christ. Good words, man. See, we only went through three verses and it was good. It was good. LJ, thank you so much. Uh, You will be a guest again. Right on. Absolutely, man. Love this time. If uh, you're tuning in for the first time and if this has provoked questions for you, uh, please email me at take and read podcast at gmail.com. That is going to be the good place to go submit questions. Obviously, you can leave comments, you can, you know, dialogue there, but I'll engage with your questions through uh, the, the take and read podcast at gmail.com email address. And again, LJ, thanks for being my guest today, and thanks for tuning in, everybody. Have a great day. Mm-hmm.